Hello everyone, welcome to the end of February and the Toronto Jug meeting. So uh, we said this last month, but uh, we'll just say it again. Since you're all here and you don't know that the meetings have moved to the last Thursday of the month. Wait, I think we're talking to the wrong crowd. But anyway, tell people we've moved the date. Uh, next meeting is March 28th. Uh, don't forget to pay. For I don't think we got any complaints last month, but don't forget to pay for the stuff you bought while you were in here. And our videos are online at tjug.ca slash videos. Thanks to Andrew's work. Thank you. Also join our Google Plus community that Jeff created for everybody. Uh, all the news items that we're going through, I scraped from that page earlier today. Uh, Jeff used to email them to me, but now we get to see them as they happen. So it's worth joining that community just to stay up to date on stuff. And finally, Jeff also commissioned one of our friends to try and make, because we don't have a logo, we just use the standard BSD licensed Duke art. So our friend Julio made this Duke logo. Uh, it's Duke with a snow jacket on. Um, <laughs> if you like it, that's great. If you have a better idea, let us know. Julio is basically starved for ideas, and this is what he came up with. So just think on that. Post to the list if you've got ideas, or the Google community. So on to the news. Uh, so there was an article posted about uh, if you're a Tomcat user, which a lot of people are. Anybody here use Tomcat? OK, yeah. Uh, how will the Java 6 end of life, which is happening right around now, affect you? Uh, so the Tomcat team is committed to keep the major versions of Tomcat based on a major version of Java that they started with. So Tomcat 6 will always work on JRE 5. Tomcat 7 will always work on JRE 6. But they noted that as long as you're not using any of the undocumented private Sun APIs, uh, your app and all of Tomcat should work just fine on the latest Java release, including 7. So they basically urge you to update to Java 7 at your earliest convenience, but promise not to break stuff on you until you go to the next major Tomcat version. Uh, they also reiterated their policy is to keep providing point updates on the last three major versions of Tomcat. So work on Tomcat 8 is already underway, which means that they're right now supporting 6, 7, and 8 with security patches. When Tomcat 9 starts, which will be soon-ish for uh, supporting the EE7 umbrella specs, uh, then they'll drop support for security patches on 6. So if you're on Tomcat 6, you should think about moving soon. And EE6 and 7 are really cool, so you should move anyway because you can use all the fun new stuff. Uh, Play 2.1 came out. Does anyone here use Play or played, played with Play in their spare time? I haven't, so I can't speak intelligently on this subject. What I got from their release notes is that they upgraded to Scala 2.10 as their base language. Um, you can now, uh, they use SBT, the Scala build tool, as, as part of their tool chain. Uh, you can now build on one version of Scala, so probably like a newer one on your workstation, and deploy on another, which is probably an older one in your deployment environment. So that's a new feature in Play 2.1. Uh, they've also modularized the framework quite a bit and also allowed for your own applications built on Play to be more modular. Um, so for example, all of the sub-projects that are in your overall Play app can each have their own router configurations. So you can have independent modules that service URLs, and it all gets merged together into one namespace when you deploy. And there's lots more stuff that I could make up stuff about, but I don't really understand because I'm not a Play user. So. Uh, Java.time is now in JDK 8. So this has been a really, really long running JSR. I think it's three or four years old now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so the reference implementation of JSR 3.10 is called 3.10, spelled out like that. Uh, and it's based heavily around Joda time, which people have been using for ages on Java, uh, which is Stephen Colburn's project to make a really nice date and time API for Java to supplement or replace Java Util date and Java Util calendar. Um, most of it is immutable. It uses builders and, and vends immutable things for you, so you can pass them around uh, without worrying about the, the functions you pass them to, modifying their values, which is good. Makes them thread safe as well. 
uh, one of the, the biggest feature advantages that you get from this, other than the immutability, is that it lets you correctly represent dates, like March 8th, without a year or a time, or 9 o'clock AM without a date or a year, or a time zone. It's just 9 in the morning. That's what that means. And you can't accurately model any of these things with the Java util date or calendar classes, because there's always a Unix time offset implied in, in what we have right now to work with. So that's neat. Uh, another example they gave was that you can have a year and a month, which if you're doing any kind of credit card processing would be the correct way to store a credit card expiration date. Uh, something else you can't do right now. But I know I've dealt with this. Jeff probably remembers when we worked together we, on um, reporting tools. Trying to model a date in Java is really hard when you have users in different time zones because, or if the database is in a different time zone, which was the specific thing we ran into, um, you tend to set the time component to zero on a date when you're just having just a date. So when you have the credit card expiration month set to March 2013, it's probably midnight on March 1st, 2013. And any part of the world that's behind us in time is going to see that as a different date because it's right on the edge. And there's, there's no safe point. Like noon might be more forgiving, but it's still not safe. So this is really going to solve a whole class of bugs that we've had to deal with with really silly code in the past. And this would be an excellent topic for a future talk or lightning talk. We're always looking for volunteers to speak about things. So think about that. We'd love to have a talk on this. Do you see this um, being migrated to JDBC or anything like that? That's a good question. Yeah, because um, we do have the Java SQL date and time classes, which unfortunately just extend date and have all the same problems. So, yes, yes, and so does this. It also models intervals. I forgot to mention that. So all I can say is I hope so, because a lot of things databases do, like have times that are independent of time zones and things like that. Uh, this supports, and it would be really cool if it made it into JDBC. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, there's also another update that was merged into JDK 8 within the past month, is that the perm gen is gone. This has been sort of a long time coming. They've been talking about it in Java 7. I think that, what was it, interned strings came out of perm gen at some point in JDK 7. Uh, so the whole concept of permgen is gone now. There's no reserved area in the heap called permgen. We now have the meta space, uh, which is allocated outside the Java heap. And by default, there's no limit on the size. It's just limited by available memory in the OS. So that's cool when you do a lot of things. Like we work in the Google Web Toolkit a lot, and the compiler for the Google Web Toolkit creates thousands of types. And often, permgen space by default isn't enough. So this will help us and our users not run into the out of memory error permgen problem, uh, because it's just a better default. It will take as much memory as it needs. The problem, though, is like when you're running in production, now you don't have that safety limit, where if you're leaking class metadata over time, it will just keep growing until the whole server runs out of memory. So there, there is a command line parameter to cap metaspace size, which you might want to do in production environments. And the last note is sort of the, the tools haven't caught up yet, like the NetBeans profiler. As of the article that I read about this, uh, the NetBeans profiler still didn't know about metaspace and was talking about permgen in JDK 8. So that'll catch up by the time JDK 8 comes out, but just be careful if you're an early adopter. So the Java 1 2012 videos came out really, really soon after the conference, which was great. And they just released all of them like a month after the conference. But it was really hard to get at them because they were in like a sidebar on this weird content management site. Uh, and now Oracle has released them all on YouTube on their Oracle Learning channel. So that's really cool. You can embed them in web pages and stuff. And uh, you can also just watch them on more devices, like sync them to your phone and watch them offline and all that great stuff. Christian's too modest, but I should, notice on his, I should note on his behalf that his and Christian's talk is also up there. Yes, Christian and I spoke at Java 1, and you can watch our talk offline. So do download it to your phone right now, watch it on the way home. <laughs> it's about Arai, so it's fun. Uh, right, NetBeans 7.3 is out. 
I was listening to the Java Spotlight podcast earlier this week, and the release manager claims this is the best release of NetBeans ever. Are you surprised to hear that? I was really surprised to hear that. Um, their headline feature is uh, better support for HTML5, so I guess they're trying to compete with the JetBrains uh, WebStorm features and that kind of stuff. Um, lots of improvements for Java in the form of refactorings and, and Java 8 support. Java FX, uh, they have code completion in FXML files now. Uh, JPA, they have a bunch of new completions in the JPQL editor and more. Uh, they've added tooling for Groovy, enhanced PHP, C and C++ tooling, and the NetBeans profiler, which is my favorite thing, I just mentioned in the last slide, um, has also been updated. There's some conferences coming up. The EclipseCon people have offered us a $100 discount if you use the Tor drug code when you're registering. I haven't been to EclipseCon, but some of the other guys in the Red Hat office have gone, and they said it's a really good conference. So you could consider that. Anything else from anybody? Jeff's very good at compiling news. I should thank Jeff again. He always, every single item that we just went over, Jeff posted. CDI 1.1 came out. No, as well, Do you the specs finished. The public, or proposed final draft has been published. Do you want to say anything about the CDI 1.1 really. PFD? Not really. No? Okay. But it's news. Uh, that's news. They're actually, the whole Java 7 umbrella spec, including all of the EE JSRs, they've all got their proposed final drafts out right now. So these are basically the next few weeks are your last chance to find any critical flaws before everything's set in stone forever. Um, so I don't know. If you like reading specs, now would be an excellent time to do that. All right, so on to the main event. Lucas Burke is going to start us off talking about System Tap for Java. Ooh. Okay, hey guys, how are you doing? My name is Lucas. Uh, I work on a tool called System Tap at the Red Hat office. I'm on the performance tools team. Um, and in today's talk, I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to System Tap and some of our new Java collection probe points. Um, so, first off, what is System Tap? Um, well, it started in 2005. It's being developed by Red Hat, IBM, and a cast of dozens. Um, you know, it's open source, so anybody can contribute. Um, and it's intended to fill the gaps between debugging, and profiling, and tracing tools. So you kind of think of it as like one tool to rule them all. Each type of tool has the pros and cons, and we've tried to incorporate the best part of all, like each different one. Um, and so what we want to do is just, it's a tool where you write some scripts with a specified language. Um, and you're able to observe many different points of the Linux system at the same time. So the overall approach to it is, so you write the system tap script, or whatever that may be. It gets compiled into a Linux kernel module. We insert it into the, the all-seen Linux kernel, at which point there is a summary report, which can be like in a format that you're choosing, it's, it's text. So that's the general workflow. Um, and if you guys have heard of Dtrace, um, it's a very similar niche to that, same idea, um, just implemented on the Linux platform. So just to go over the language itself quickly, um, you specify what's called a probe point. And a probe point is just you know, something of interest to you, a function call, a syscall. Um, and the, the basic idea is you say you know, probe, the trigger point, and then the, the curly braces, what you want to do once you hit that. So do you want to like, print out hello world or print out what that function actually was? perhaps a parameter of that function. Um, it can be something as simple as, you know, on begin, as soon as this script starts, you print out hello world and exit, that's it. Or you can get a little bit more in depth. So say on the process ls, whenever we hit the function called main, um, what we want to do is we want to print out, okay, ls started, um, and we have x arguments, and the command line string that was passed to it was so-and-so. So, you know, it's a fully feature set language. You got loops, recursion functions, strings, arrays. Um, and there's a full set of examples on our system tab website. Feel free to take a look and see what you can actually do with it. It's a pretty neat tool. Um, so, in order to make it easier for you to use the tool, uh, we've developed what are called, what are called tap sets. Um, and they're a collection of pro points and helper functions. And just as an example of a helper function, the example we gave before, we said, okay, for the number of command or parameters we passed ls, um, and we want the actual string that was passed to ls, you could do that in a, a lower level way. 
by saying, you know, you still got the probe point, ls, function main, and then you're still going to print it out. But you could iterate through every parameter passed, although that's kind of tedious and it makes it harder than it should. So that's why we came up with things like command string. Just it's, it makes it easier for you. It's like, I guess, an API almost. Um, yeah, so batteries are included. Um, as of the latest release is 2.1, we have over 2,000 different pro points that we've specified that you can take a look at. So kernel functions, process functions, um, timers, syscalls. Um, and then we've gotten a lot of you know, high level subsystems that I mean, may be of interest to you. So memory, networking, perf, if you're familiar with that tool, the hardware performance counters. Um, so we've really made an effort to have essentially any part of the system you'd be interested in, we can probe. And just as a quick demo, I don't usually do live demos because things tend to break, <laughs> just natural. Um, so this is a system tap script, the same one we've showed before. Uh, and you know, if you run it using stop, this would be a sample output. So you'd start with, where's my pointer? You know, if it's like an ls of a certain directory, you say arg equals two params in the directory or color auto, if you got color equals auto plus l, so it'll just print out whatever you put in. Uh, this also expands the user space. So say you've written an application, obviously you want to be able to use this tool in conjunction to see if you know, maybe a syscall is happening too often, I've got deadlock. You want to you know, take a step back. And this is where it comes in you know, real strength of system tap, is the ability to step back and see how multiple pieces of the system work together. Um, so you know, profiling and tracing, uh, it's a bit more flexible than those types of tools. Uh, debugging, so every piece of debug information within a program we have access to, so with Dorf. Um, and this is a very similar process, right? You have a system tap script, gets compiled into a Linux kernel module, it's inserted as a probe, and you just have information passed back and forth. Right? So very similar. And once again, you got a summary report of you know, that program. Um, and one big selling feature we have is you can attach to online processes already. You don't have to invoke it with, so you can use you know, system tap on a live database, right? You don't have to take down your production server, right? That's not something you want, like a debugger would have to do. So just as an example, the second demo. So you, this is just a you know, C++ program. Forget all this header stuff. We, what you want to see is we've got a function called ping or a method. Um, it's going to sleep every four seconds and state will equal n, but in our main loop, we're just going to keep looping and just iterate n, so state's just going to keep moving up. Uh, we compile it with debug information, and the script we're going to use is so on the process a.out, on the function ping, uh, we want to see what process it is, so the PID, and what the state variable is, so just how high it's counted, right? Um, so we start running a.out, you'll see nothing on the terminal, um, if you run the script in a different terminal, you see the PID and the state, and you'll see, because we started it after the fact, you're starting at state 2, 3, 4, 5. So let's say then we you know, suspend a.out, send it to the background, and then start a new a.out. So we have two process ideas incrementing the state. Um, without having to do anything, system tap will pick up that a.out has another instance running, and you'll see how the different states are interwoven in there with the you know, 0, 9, 1, 10, 2. Right, so you doesn't have to. You don't have to start the process with it. You can if you want. So what's the value? Um, it's a secure framework for writing and injecting code to gather information about the system. Um, uh, we've got a, like the tap sets we mentioned before. It's just essentially a huge set of glue utility code um, to help dealing with all the different subsystems in conjunction with each other. Um, yeah, and I mean, once again, with the global observability, the goal is to be very flexible. And these are scenarios that you wouldn't normally come across, so you need some type of like special scenario or script. Um, and if you ever, if you take a look at our you know, examples and you see something, that, oh, this would be really useful, and you guys don't have an example, send it to us. We can we can add it. Um, so you know, some things we can improve on. Uh, we, you know, we're very much C C++ runtime. So take it easy on me, I am a C++ guy, so it speaks slow when talking Java. Um, but so we're always looking to improve it, expand the language we support. Um, so for instance, like say garbage collection. Um, injecting a uh, kernel module can be considered somewhat invasive. Uh, with 2.1, we've also introduced a, uh, a user space only runtime, so we can uh, sidestep that. Um, and we do also have, you know, security checks because you can do dangerous stuff with it. I mean, you've installed it with Root, so I mean, Root's already there. 
Uh, but we don't want someone privileged user saying, hey, on every syscall, RM or file. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so the injection mechanism we use is through a tool called Dynance. It's kind of off topic, though. Um, yeah, so Java. I don't need to give you guys an introduction on that. You know what it is. But in terms of garbage collection, this was a specific focus that we had. Um, I'm sure you guys are all aware of it, but there are many different garbage collection algorithms that you can use. You know, you got uh, the serial collector, parallel collector, parallel compacting collector, parallel young generation collector, and the list goes on. Um, the goal here is to say, if maybe you're not an expert in different algorithms and you want to see how your application would perform using, say, a different type of algorithm, using system tap to be able to do that would be really useful, especially when, you know, say there's, you got a database involved with it as well, you want to see who's accessing that, what could be slow. So we do have tools that exist to examine virtual machines, like the JVM, the thermostat, which you'll hear about next, uh, JROC and machine control, visual VM, and you know, command line based options. And these are all great. I'm not knocking these tools and don't take it that way. We're just interested, again, in taking the step back and seeing the global picture of the system. So we want the wider scope. So if you know Dtrace, Dtrace already has some pro points in the JVM. And we've decided to extend those and still make those available. Um, so if I've added in probe points that, you know, uh, parallel mark sweep begin end, um, and there's a whole list of them. These are just a few of them. And so here's the probe point, say, you know, garbage collection, PC mark, mark sweep begin. Um, you get the name, oops, sorry. You get the name of the string, the address, the cause of the garbage collection, and then any arguments along with it. It can be just concatenated into a probe string to make it easy for you. That's the tap set again. So I apologize for the small text on the squash screen, but there's a bunch of them. You can check it out with just by listening to the system tab. Um, so just as a demo, uh, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Decapo. It's a benchmarking suite. Its big selling point is the fact is that it uses real world applications in order to show like realistic performance and what's going on in your system. So if I were to write, want to write a system tap script for that, I could say, you know, system tap, uh, probe every single hotspot garbage whatever type of garbage collection is going to be every beginning I just want to print out that it's begun on every single end of a garbage collection I don't care what type it is print out end you can do things like you know time how long it's been in garbage collection or not what like you know extend the profile that way if you want um, I actually want system tap to directly launch the decapo benchmark sweep I'm going to run the eclipse benchmark because I can and then just output all the information to a file so I can look at it later. Now, some output that you would see from that, um, you'd see something like, you, you know, you print out begin. Oh, look, I've got a scavenger begin at such address. And the cause, well, the tenure generation is full. Or the G1 evacuation pause. So you'd be able to see what's actually going on and, you know, try out different garbage collection algorithms. See what's most efficient for you. Now, using the JVM, you can see the, these are, you know, Pro points within the JVM. It also works if you have another language like JRuby. So running a JRuby script, I'm not an expert in JRuby either, but basically requiring benchmark and running through a set of benchmarks. Uh, you'd see output similar to this. I mean, the point being, it still works even if you've got another language implemented on the JVM. So you got a whole bunch of tenured garbage collections. So if you do have any questions or want to learn more about the tool, um, these are all our contact information, system tap on Freenode, system tap at Sourceware. Um, and I mean, we do want to go further than that. I mean, I don't want to have, say, uh, my syscall and functions set from my database and whatnot. So what I've recently been tasked on doing, and this is the first time I'm showing it, hopefully it doesn't break, um, is the goal of having per method system tap results. So in the C runtime, turn around and say, I've had a method hit here, here, and here, and here on a dynamic basis. So what I've got here is, sorry, I use Emacs, any of them users. Um, basically, on the left-hand side there, I've got a threaded program that basically it's going to hit a different method to print out. Oh, you've, you've specified an integer or a float, and here's a specified value. This is just for testing, OK? Um, so I'm going to launch that program. Now this is all, it's kind of glued together or whatnot. I'm still hashing out, making it look pretty in the final release. Um, but what we're, we're going to do now is we're going to double check what PID it is. And I'm leveraging a tool here called Byteman. I'm not sure if you've any heard of it. It's, um, it can, can transform classes depending on a specified rule or whatnot. So using Byteman, 
I'm going to install on this process. So it's just basically attached to it. And then I've also written a rule. Let's see. That will let me know. So there we go. So basically, this is what a rule looks like. I'll take you through one really quickly. Um, so you've got a rule. You can call it whatever you want. You specify what class you're interested in. Just for easy use, I said on an object class, whatever. Um, on a method, I've got a whole bunch of print messages. You can also specify what the uh, uh, arguments passed to it are. And I've created a, a special little help, um, native library and helper class called helper SDT, version. this is version two, but. Um, and then at the entry of whatever method it is, in this case print message, I'm gonna call my specific method um, and it should hopefully print out on the screen. So let's see, you know, I got a system tap script that this will hopefully all be behind the scenes once it's fully released. But basically I want to say what was the method that I called and what was the first argument passed to it. So within system tap, run it and then say I'm passing an integer. And then so 42, print message was called and the value was 42. Um, let's say a byte, a value 10 message value 10. So that way you can take this a step further. And if you do have other C programs interacting with a database that's interacting with a Java program, um, you can see per method what's going on from the C runtime. Uh, that's the latest and greatest. Any questions? So I'm just trying to infer from this. Is there, can you add a probe point to your Java program by inserting a method call into the, into the method? Um, How would you add probe points to your own one of the things about system tap, like, and what I'm aiming for eventually in this tool specifically, is that you won't have to make any modifications to your program whatsoever. The end result of this will be the same as a regular system tap script, where I just say, "Hey, on a print message, I want to know when you hit it." You can do that with uh, your own regular source print, uh, user space program as well. You don't have to make any modifications to the program. So you'll have something where you write a system tap script. It yep. uses ByteMan to change your stuff at runtime. Yeah to add in the probe points that system tap then re reacts to it. Yeah, basically it'll have a, a, a helper method which it'll call instead, uh, which will then hook into system tap. Yeah. So hopefully <coughs> the, one of the big goals is also very low overhead, so this won't change your program unless you actually ask it to. So just to, just to clarify so I understand, mm -hmm. is a probe point something that can be expressed in bytecode, or is it something that's lower level? Um, so system tap interacts with uh, probe points in C. Okay. We have special markers that we use. Okay. Um, and I've, I've maintained those in C, but made a native call. Okay. So you do that by invoking a native method? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hopefully at the end of the day, when all this is shipped in the official system tap release, the only thing you'll actually see is uh, a nice a script here that's a bit nicer in the, the output. Um, and you won't actually have to write any of the stuff on the left. You won't have to attach and know the PID of a process. That'll all be specified. But this is just a preview of what to come. Any other questions at all? Come be, feel free to come talk to me after. Um, yeah. I don't bite, <laughs> I promise. When, yeah. when system tap, when the, the script <coughs> is done, do the classes revert back to their old? Um, not sure with ByteMan. I have to look on the ByteMan side though. I leave all the Java manipulation itself to buy that. Okay, okay. So you're just yeah. Consider yeah. that an RIP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's coming. Cool. Well, thank you guys very much for having me. And uh, thanks. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Amir. Uh, I'm a developer. I work at Red Hat. And today I'm going to be talking about thermostat. Uh, more specifically, I'm going to talk, well, my talk is divided roughly into two parts. And one of them is an overview of thermostat, what thermostat is, how do you use it, uh, you know, what's the current status of the project. And then I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about plugins, what thermostat plugins are, and give you a little bit of a tutorial on how to write one. And in the end, I'm going to try and leave you with pointers on what, you, what to do next if you're interested. So let's get started. Uh, first thing, what is thermostat? So as uh, John mentioned, John gave a talk la last year about thermostat. Uh, this is a, just a quick review, review slash reminder if you forgot. So thermostat, first of all, is a tool. Uh, it's, a to it's a serviceability tool. What it does is that it allows you to inspect programs that are running for performance problems. Uh, you can uh, figure out where your problems are, what performance, uh, 
worst performance lagging uh, and hopefully fix them. Uh, to do that, thermostat not only examines your <coughs> Java program, but also the environment the program is running in. So that includes the operating system and what have you. Uh, but also, the thermostat is open source. It's actually released under GPL plus class path ex exception license, which is the same license used in OpenJDK and GCJ. Uh, thermostat is also a community. We're fairly small, but most of our meetings uh, are done in the open. So we have meetings on IRC. We have discussion on mailing list. Uh, we have a public bug tracker. So anybody interested can come in at any point, see what's happening. Uh, currently, with Thermostat, we're actually targeting OpenJDK and Linux. This does not mean we don't care about other platforms or we're not going to support them at all. It's just that none of us are actually working on it. So if you're interested in adding support for that, feel free to come in, uh, send us suggestions, patches, fixes, or even new features. So one of the things I really like about Thermostat is that it integrates horizontally. Uh, what I mean by that is that it scales across computers. Uh, you can run it on your own development machine to see how the performance of your application is. You can use it to monitor programs that are running <coughs> on a remote server there. Or you can even run it across your cluster, your server farm, to see how performance of Java applications there is. Thermostat also integrates vertically. And what I mean by that is that we try, we'll try to take advantage of all of the stack that we have access to. So uh, because we run on Linux, we know we have tools, fantastic tools like SystemTap that we can use to figure out what's happening in native pieces of the code. Uh, we have access to the code, and we can modify OpenJDK. So we can add more features there to figure out more stuff that we can extract for. Uh, we can also hopefully integrate with application platforms and application servers. So if you're, say, running something on JBoss, hopefully we'll be able to point out, oh, your application number this running under JBoss has this problem. Um, so a quick overview of the design at it, as it is, thermostat is basically three parts. There's agents on the left, there's storage in the middle, and clients on the right. Uh, it's the agent's responsibility to collect data and push it out to the storage. And then any client can come in at any point and ask uh, th the storage for data. And then it can display it as however it chooses to. So the next question I guess is, OK, it's all cool, but how do you actually use thermostat? Well, there's a small demo I'd like to do. Uh, but first, I just want to point out, that, er, as I said earlier, there are a couple ways you can run thermostat. You can run in a cluster on your single machine, what have you. So I'm just going to show you the simplest thing, which is running on your local machine. And that requires just two commands, uh, service and GUI. Service will start thermostat agent and storage, and GUI will show us the GUI client, of course. So let me try and ha get that working. OK. So first thing I'm going to do is run service. So that's a path to the binary I have. So I'm going to run service here, and it prints out a whole bunch of stuff. That means it's working. Uh, then I'm going to do GUI. And that will hopefully start the main GUI, which, of course, pops up on the wrong screen. So yeah, so this is the main thermostat program. Um, it's roughly divided into two parts. There is uh, a list on the left, and their content area on the right. So this list on the left actually shows you all the machines that Thermostat knows about. Right now, it's just running under my machine, so you know, just my machine. And it also shows all the VMs that are running on that machine. And for each uh, host that you click on, you can actually see information. Like in this case, you can see some basic information about hardware, uh, machine names, some software basics, and so on. You can see what the performance characteristics of this machine is, so how much CPU is <coughs> being used. Uh, various memory allocation stats. Uh, there's also some information about NUMA. Uh, this is just one NUMA node, so there's not much to say there. Uh, it's just 100% hit rate. Uh, you can click on an application and see a review about that. So we had the process ID, when it started running, whether it stopped, uh, the main class, command line, some real information, and parameters if you pass them. Uh, you can also see CPU information, so how much CPU is this application using, you can also find out how often GC has been occurring, uh, how long it has been taking. So this is GC running on new generation and old. Uh, no GC there, that's good. Uh, classes that are loaded, different memory region sizes, 
uh, there's also some information about the heap. So this is just showing allocated versus, sorry, uh, allocated versus used. But you can trigger a heap dump to get more information. So if I click here, it takes a little while because it's big. Uh, but yeah, you can get a, a list of objects, or sorry, classes rather, uh, and then instances of that class that are allocated in the size and bytes. Uh, you can also search for random objects that you feel like. <coughs> so I know, oh, nothing found here, okay. So yeah, so you can search for various things and you'll get information here that matches. Uh, so I see lots of tree maps allocated. Uh, you can see what the entries are, what the sizes are, so forth, if you're interested. You can also see some information about threads. Now, this is one of the aspects of thermostat we've had to compromise on. Uh, ideally, it'd be great to extract all the information from all programs when possible. Uh, for some cases, that actually turns out to be a little too expensive. So in this case, we don't actually monitor all threads by default. Uh, but we can turn it on when needed. And then we get all the information about threads, so which threads are running, which states they're in, and so forth. So, yeah, so that's how the GUI pretty much looks and works like. Uh, there's also a command line interface if you're a command line junkie. Uh, you can do help to show you a list of commands that are supported currently. You can even run commands. Uh, and then it shows you basically the same thing uh, as a GUI. Here are all the VMs that Thermostat knows about, and you can see there's one VM that's running, two VMs that's running, and another one, sorry, two more that are running, and a bunch of them that exited. again. Like if the VM only exists for like a second, does it notice, or is uh, there a so yeah, right now it uses sampling mechanisms, so I think it has to exist for like a second or two to, for it to notice. Uh, if something exits before then, it may actually miss a start or a stop. Okay, just wondering. Yes. Yeah, so what's the current status of thermostat? Um, here's a timeline of the project so far. So we had our first release in February 2012, our 0 0.1 release. And then since then, we've had a bunch of releases. We released 0 0.5 a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we hope to release 0 0.6 in sometime in the next month. And then hopefully we're going to go towards 1.0, where we promise to have API stability. So here's a list of features. I've mostly talked about them. This is just listing them. We have some basic host information, some VM information, we can get GC information, threads, and, and heaps. Some of the features we really want to work on are improved NUMA support. Uh, we would like to be able to run your application, uh, a large application on a machine with many NUMA nodes, and figure out how your performance characteristic is affected by NUMA. Is there something you can do to tune or tune, uh, sorry, tune to improve performance uh, based on NUMA? Uh, we'd like to be able to take advantage of excellent uh, tools that we have on Linux, like System Tab and OProfile, to get access to a uh, native part of the stack so we can figure out is the performance, uh, are, if there are any performance issues, are they occurring on the Java side or on the native side? Uh, even Java side memory tracing and analysis would be great to have. <coughs> We've actually started working on Eclipse integration. So I showed you a Swing GUI client. Uh, we're also working on Eclipse side, uh, which is not as good as our Swing client yet, but we hope in the next couple of releases it'll be just as good. And of course, we would like to have some sort of overview where you can find out where instead of looking through everything, it will tell you, oh, here are the, all the issues that I've spotted in all the VMs that you're running. But aside from features, uh, something we've uh, thought about is that we would like thermostat to be extensible. And I mean two aspects here. Uh, first, we want to be able to access application-specific information. What I mean by that is a lot of times you have custom applications that do something that no other application can. Uh, let's say it's an example. You have an application that sends out email. Performance for that application is just how many emails does it send out per hour. Uh, so thermostat can tell you lots of statistics about how much CPU is being used and so on. But really, to get a good idea of uh, how fast your program is, you just want to measure how many emails is it sending out. 
And it'd be great if that application could tell Thermostat that how, ma how many emails is it sending out. So we could actually utilize that information uh, and figure out what the performance is. So that's one. And then the other thing we hopefully want to be extensible is that we want to be able to add or remove optional features, uh, even update them without touching the core parts of Thermostat. So you don't have to worry about uh, you know, significant changes to your stack. And to solve both of those, we came up with the idea of plugins. So what is a plugin? Well, in Thermostat, almost everything is a plugin. Uh, let me try and explain that more. So we have plugins on the agent side. Uh, we call them backends. So it's a job of backends to actually collect data and send it over to storage. Uh, so here I have examples of two backends. The first backend, called backend one, uh, reads data from slash proc. So it gathers your system information, sends it over to the agent. Um, the second backend, in this case, backend two, uh, uses JVM stat to collect information from your VM itself uh, and then sends it over to storage. We have backends on the client GUI. For example, this tab that I showed you with uh, where you can search for heap dumps and objects, it's actually entirely a plugin. It's not part of core thermostat. We also have plugins on the command line. So uh, as I showed you, when you run the shell, you get a list of all the commands you can use. Uh, some of the commands like GUI, service, agent, help are built in, but a lot of programs aren't. So here's a list of commands, for example, that the same plugin that supplies the GUI to view objects in heaps, uh, it provides these commands too. So you can do the same thing you could do on the GUI on the command line, if you really like command lines. So that's cool, but how do you write a plugin? Well, first thing is that we run on top of OSGI. So Thermostat runs on the OSGI uh, platform. We All Thermostat jars are OSGI bundles. And plugins must also be OSGI bundles. So the basic steps to create a plugin goes sort of like this. You write code to implement the functionality you're interested in. We provide you with a bunch of APIs that you can use to either set, uh, send information or get information and s or so on. Uh, then you write this file called plugin.xml that describes your plugin. Uh, and then you put all those things under the plugins folder so Thermostat knows about it. So I'm going to try and quickly go over what a code for a, a plugin that does <coughs> the famous Hello World might look like. So this plugin will just uh, print out hello world on the command line. So the first part is obviously the code. Uh, OSGI framework, so we have access to a pretty good life cycle for our plugin, uh, the start and the stop. So in this case, what we want to do on start is actually create an object that represents the hello world command. So when the user types hello world, this object will be invoked. I'm going to go over the code for that in a bit. Uh, but then the next step we want to do is to register it as an OSGI service with the name hello. And nothing to do when our plugin stops. The next step is obviously the hello command itself. So this is pretty simple. We just have one main line here. Oh, I can't find my mouse. Oh, yeah, sorry. So just the main, the run method is what gets invoked uh, when this plugin is called. So when you enter hello, this code gets invoked, and we just get the console and print hello world. And there's some other stuff that you need to tell you know, what the name of the command is, and it doesn't actually need access to storage. It's just really simple. Um, and then, so once you have the code, then you need your plugin XML that describes uh, what your plugin does. So in this case, uh, it looks like the following. You have a plugin, OK, uh, and then you, it's, it provides one command. And notice it provides your uh, plugins and extend command. So if you want to add functionality to GUI, you just say extends instead of provides. This one just provides a new command that's named hello. There's some description and how to use this. And it just tells which bundles you want to use when you run hello. So once you have all that, you know, you build it, you compile your jar, you put it under your thermostat directly, directory, and then when you start the shell, you can do hello world. Um, so that was a really, really simple plugin. Here are examples of more complicated plugins that you could look at if you're interested. Uh, I mentioned before we provide a bunch of API to make it easier for plugins to do their job. So we split that API into roughly two pieces. Uh, we call them extension points and services. So if a plugin provides something to the rest of thermostat, uh, it's called an extension point. And if it's a service that thermostat provides to the plugin, we call it a service. So for example, the ex uh, command we saw called hello world, 
Uh, well, that's a command, and it's an extension point because it's something the plugin provides to the thermostat. Uh, other examples include backend. Backends provide something to an agent, and the tabs that we saw in the GUI, which are called information service. Uh, then there's facilities that thermostat provides. So if you want to push data into thermostat, use storage. If you want to keep something secure in thermostat, you call it the key ring. Um, there's a more complete list of our API, which is there, but uh, it's quite a bit, but so far we've found it more or less what we need to get our job done. Um, one way we've been exercising this API is because most of our core functionality that I talked about is implemented in plugins too. Can a single plugin provide more than one kind of extension point? Yep, so, uh, a pl so as a, the Hello World plugin that I showed was a very simplified version. Uh, the link that I posted to Hello World, it's one plugin that provides a GUI command. So it modifies your GUI and gives you a command line access to it. And you can do that for as much as you want. Okay. I guess for modularity's sake, you want to keep minimal in each plugin, but right. you can combine stuff. I was thinking about um, it would be really cool to make a backend to gather information from <coughs> MBs but you'd probably have some associated commands that would go with that, I would guess. I, that's okay. what I was thinking. Well, sure, I mean, I mean uh, the plugin would gather data from mbeans, so that'd be a backend, and if you want to read it on the client side, you'd make a command for that, and then load it under different commands. That could work. Right, okay, cool. So yeah, I mean, if you're here and you're interested so far, uh, where do you want to go next? Well, uh, here's what I recommend. Uh, our homepage, ic.classpad.org slash thermostat. Uh, we have links to our mailing list, wiki, RC, everything you basically want to know. Uh, we have links to tutorials there, how, how the plugin format is, uh, screenshots, anything you want to see. And that's all. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you learned something. Thanks.